Right. Uh, so I, I guess uh, during the past few days, you've learned a lot how to construct gene lists uh, from your experimental data. Uh, the learning object objectives of this module are the following. Is this going without my intervention? <laughs> Yes, I can't speak that fast. That's better. Uh, so by the end of this module, you should be able to identify situations and, uh, and places where you can use pathway enrichment analysis or pathway network analysis. Uh, you should be able to understand the main components of the simplest pathway analysis, these being gene lists from your experiments and then pathways that are also often represented as, as gene lists. Uh, uh, one major hurdle, which is a bit boring, but you have to do it nevertheless, is to manage all these uh, different gene IDs and names and symbols and so on. We have a quick look at that, and uh, then we uh, go through how, uh, how those gene lists uh, corresponding to pathways and networks are actually created, or where do they come from. Um, so the premise is the following. Uh, you've uh, performed just your new... Uh, super cool screen that nobody has even heard of, or maybe you sequenced a lot of genomes or you do, did some RNA sequencing in order to understand transcriptomics. Uh, and uh, then that screen or experiment produces a hundred or a thousand genes. And uh, your PI or your collaborators tell you, uh, so what is interesting about these hundreds of, or thousands of genes? How do they fit our experiment? Or why should we care about those hundreds or, or thousands of genes? And then probably you, the first thing that you want to do is you want to go to the PubMed database to see existing li literature about those genes, which is fine if you have a couple of genes, but you don't want to do that systematically when you have hundreds of thousands of genes because it will take so much of your time. So uh, generating gene lists uh, depends on what type of data you're looking at. It may be proteomics data or or sequencing data, and the techniques are different to extract gene lists from those uh, different sources of data. However, some techniques can be the same, such as ranking or filtering or clustering. They all end up in lists of genes. And all the pathway and network analysis is how to go forward from these lists of genes uh, back into the biological functions or processes uh, that are involved. Uh, so you can use a, a wide variety of analysis tools that are publicly available to perform a pathway enrichment analysis to understand the gene lists uh, and to drill down to some biological mechanism. And maybe if you're lucky, you find something new and exciting about the biology. Uh, pathway enrichment analysis uh, will help you to find uh, candidate genes to follow up with. Maybe you explain some causes of disease, understand some biological functions and so on. And as I mentioned, you don't want to do this uh, manually because uh, every gene has been, well, many genes have been studied very comprehensively. There, there can be uh, hundreds of papers available for any particular gene. Uh, and instead of, uh, instead of curating the literature manually, a pathway enrichment analysis uh, or network analysis will provide a shortcut uh, to analyzing gene function uh, because uh, much of this information has been systematically annotated into databases, and you can access these databases using uh, statistical means rather than uh, going through papers one by one. Uh, pathway analysis and network analysis may provide the missing link between uh, interpreting genotype and, uh, and phenotype, explaining phenotypes using uh, genotype information. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, you can uh, collect information from the genomes. Uh, through, for example, whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing. Uh, on the other hand, you have some sort of uh, phenotypic information. Maybe this is uh, uh, proteomics. Uh, maybe this is uh, patient survival curves from a clinical study. Uh, maybe this is uh, inheritance trees. Now, pathways are the middle, the complex uh, component in the middle, which actually synthesizes knowledge from previous experiments, uh, multiple different databases, uh, literature, and uh, expert curation. Uh, and you can predict the effects uh, of, in, of variation in the genome uh, on the pathways and try to explain your, your phenotypic ob observations. Uh, so a bit more formally, uh, pathway and network analysis is generally any uh, computational or statistical technique uh, that takes advantage of network and pathway information from previous uh, studies or previous uh, literature. Most commonly, it is uh, applied uh, to interpret lists of genes, 
the most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, but there are many other more complex types uh, covered during this workshop. And it helps gain mechanistic insights into omics data. So omics data could come from diverse sources, uh, but generally, uh, if it boils down to a list of genes, many pathway and network tools uh, are available uh, to understand those uh, data. Uh, so there's a bit of a, a difference uh, between pathways and networks. Uh, I'll try to give my, my perspective into it, and every other person you talk to will have their own understanding. So my understanding is the following. Uh, pathways and networks uh, both include systems of genes or proteins or molecules, transcripts and so on. And they are system in the sense that there are interactions between those uh, components. So genes or protein interact with one another. But there are also somewhat, uh, there's also some differences between pathways and networks. Uh, pathways are often being called uh, small scale uh, systems that are fairly well described. They may be a consensus uh, synthesis of many years of knowledge and uh, research. Uh, the interactions in pathways are often uh, biochemical reactions, so they are very detailed. There's a lot of knowledge about them. Uh, they're co collected into a specific pathway databases. Uh, maybe they co contain dozens of genes and proteins, maybe hundreds, like say a few hundred, but no more. Uh, networks, on the other hand, are usually a large scale. They're more noisy. Uh, they contain perhaps hidden information that's not well characterized in pathway databases. Uh, they are simply they are abstractions of simplified cellular logic. Uh, uh, the edges in the pathway in the networks uh, are not that clear what they often mean. Maybe they are physical interactions. Maybe they are genetic interactions. Maybe they are some sort of activating or inhibitory patterns. Uh, but they they may contain stuff that we don't really know about yet. Uh, networks often are derived from high throughput experiments or maybe even uh, statistical integration of multiple types of data. So network data may be available for all genes in the genome. Pathway data is available for a much smaller fraction. Uh, so here's a busy slide trying to summarize multiple types of pathway network of an ana ana analysis in a sort of a simple way. Uh, there are several, uh, there are many, many different techniques, and you can summarize these perhaps in three different categories. Uh, the first one, which is the focus of this uh, seminar, is the enrichment of fixed gene sets. Uh, so this is shown here. Uh, and this is basically identification of pre-built pathways in your gene list of interest that are somehow either significantly enriched or significantly modified uh, but this is based on existing information about pathways from the, from the literature. Now, the second type of analysis is called de novo subnetwork construction and clustering. So re this refers to uh, uh, still your gene list of interest from your experiment, but instead of looking at predefined pathways, uh, we look at large-scale predefined networks and then try to extract some certain areas of the networks which connect your list of genes. And then the third most complex type of analysis is called pathway or network-based modeling, uh, in which we collect uh, some pathway rules of activation and inhibition, for example, from pathway databases. And then we see if our gene list is consistent with these rules, or maybe instead our gene list represents some new uh, unrecognized pathway rules. Uh, so I've been looking um, a lot into cancer genomics, and perhaps uh, an explanation of uh, when you analyze cancer genomes, then these type, different types of analysis try to answer the following questions. So the first, uh, the first analysis of fixed gene set enrichment uh, tries to tell you what types of biological processes are represented or enriched or altered in this, in this particular cancer type. And so the second, uh, uh, second type of analysis uh, tries to figure out whether there are new pathways or new associations uh, that are relevant to this particular cancer, and maybe, maybe there are some uh, clinical subtypes uh, where different pathways are activated or inhibited. Uh, and the third most complex modeling, uh, which evaluates those pathway rules, uh, sees uh, if there are pathway activities uh, altered in a particular patient, uh, and maybe there are some drug tar targetable pathways available um, uh, in this patient because we see that some rules, some well-known pathway rules are broken in that particular patient. Uh, so in this particular lecture, we're mostly looking at the enrichment of fixed gene sets because this is 
uh, most applicable. You need uh, uh, you don't need a lot of uh, detailed data to it, and you can apply it to all kinds of different uh, experimental data sets. Uh, so there are multiple benefits of analyzing uh, data on the level of pathways rather than on the level of individual genes. So the first idea is improved statistical power. So for, for example, when you look at uh, uh, gene expression data, then you're probably focusing on, say, 20,000 human genes, or maybe 6,000 yeast genes. Uh, when you do pathway enrichment analysis, you can probably focus on, say, 2,000 pathways or maybe 500 pathways, which is a much smaller number, and therefore you do less statistical tests, and you need to apply the uh, multiple testing correction in the less strict manner. So you will have more chance of finding biologically re significant results if these are present in your data. So fewer tests is generally good if you're doing high throughput analysis. Uh, also, pathway data may be more reproducible. So for any particular sample, you may be seeing some genes being upregulated, some genes being downregulated in the gene expression data set. If you're looking at the level of pathways, then you're analyzing uh, many components of the pathway at the same time. So if you encounter a new set of samples and the, bio the biology really involves that pathway, you may see that pathway over again. Because uh, maybe different components are ordered, but it's still the same pathway. So that increases your reproducibility. You're basically doing a, a set of tests again for the older pathways when analyzing uh, your restricted set of genes. Right? Mm Although I do, uh, do understand the question and I agree, in the, such a setup you apply multiple testing twice, first for all your genes to filter out your gene list and then for all the pathways. So in a sense, yes, you're, you're testing, totally you're testing more, but when you compare it to say testing your individual genes and your gene list being the final result versus your pathway list being your final result, then you're still encountering better power. Yes. So where was I? I think the next point is about easier interpretation. Uh, and this is, uh, this is more comfortable because when you're looking at pathway data, you can use uh, concepts from cell and molecular biology in order to explain your data. Uh, for example, you can say that in my experiment, cell cycle genes are upregulated, and that's much easier to understand than dealing with an alphabet soup of different symbols being upregulated, downregulated, and modified. Uh, and uh, then the pathway enrichment analysis also allows you to get a step closer to the mechanism, uh, because by, by conducting that type of analysis, you'll be able to identify processes that may be uh, responsible for the, uh, for the changes you see in your experiment. Uh, and then you can also use guilt by association or birds of a feather principle in order to predict new functions to your genes. For example, if you see um, a, a large enrichment of a particular pathway in your gene list that you derived from an experiment, and then there's, there's a few other genes that are not well known to be associated to that pathway, you may be able to predict that maybe these new uncharacterized genes also have a role in that process or pathway. And that can point you to some pretty detailed experiments, what to do next to maybe find out about the role of those genes.
I'm sure that this before analysis has been covered well in the previous lectures, but I, I still I need to emphasize the importance of it because pathway analysis is sensitive to the garbage in, garbage out uh, principle. So if you haven't performed uh, high quality analysis of your input data or the experimental data, pathway analysis may reveal stuff that looks really interesting, but is actually an artifact or a technical or biological artifact uh, of the way the data were processed. So it's important to normalize your data, perform background adjustment for microarrays or proper sequence alignment for RNA-seq. It's important to look at quality control, make sure that the samples you're analyzing are really the, the samples you're analyzing, not, not due to some, say, sample mislabeling. You need to use specific statistical tests that depend on which type of data you're looking at, whether it's count data or whether it's normal distributive intensity data. Genes list size also matters. Uh, okay, is it bad in the back? Hello? Uh, yeah, it's just... Is it better now? Yeah. One, two, no? I'll try to speak up. <laughs> so gene set size also matters. Uh, personally, I find that there's a sweet spot between, say, uh, up to a, uh, beginning from low hundreds uh, to a thousand. If your gene set... Uh, a gene list is in the thousands, then maybe something's wrong. Uh, then you need to look at the gene list in a different way. Uh, lists, uh, very small lists, like dozens of genes or, or a dozen of genes, doesn't often result in high quality pathway analysis and so on. And gene IDs need to be comfortable uh, with the software. This is a big problem uh, because there are so many gene IDs and there are more and more coming out every day. Uh, here's a quick overview of how pathway analysis uh, looks like. First, you collect your genomics data. You rank and normalize and analyze and, and filter your genomics data, and you generate a gene list. And the gene list is the main input to pathway analysis, uh, where you use uh, statistical techniques in order to distinguish which pathways are important uh, regarding your gene list. Uh, you can use visualization techniques in order to summarize these pathways in a smart way. Uh, then you can focus on particular pathways and then try to drill down to the mechanism, link them back to the genes, understand what's known, but then you don't need to do hundreds of PubMed uh, queries, but maybe dozens or even less. And uh, you can uh, use pathway analysis in order to give you further follow-up experiments, and uh, then hopefully you'll be able to publish this really well. So the reasonable size of the genes is It depends. So. Yeah. So what is a reasonable size of a gene list? I would say if you have, uh, say, 20 genes, then you're likely that the pathway analysis won't highlight a lot. If you have a large gene list, say, uh, hundreds to thousands, then you need to, you need to have a rank to that. So if you just have a, a gene list with uh, 5,000 genes, it's probably not going to highlight anything in the pathway analysis unless you allow it to be ranked. So the first genes will be more important, the, the following ones a little less important, and then you, you use a prioritized ranked list uh, analysis. So if you just compare one list to another, then probably like, say, low hundreds would be around the sweet spot. So from a statistical viewpoint, the simplest type of pathway Enrichment analysis is a, is a comparison of two sets of genes, uh, conveniently shown with this Venn diagram. So on the one hand, you have a list of genes from your experiment. For example, you're looking at brain cancer data, and you're, you're analyzing the genes that are down-regulated uh, in drug-sensitive uh, drug sensitive brain cancer cell lines. Uh, and on the other hand, you have another list of genes, and potentially many lists of genes, that correspond to uh, public knowledge about gene function. So, for example, that could be all the genes that are known to be involved in neurotransmitter signaling. And then you compare those two gene lists with a statistical test, such as the Fisher's exact test, or a test based on the hypergeometric distribution, uh, to determine whether there are more annotations or more uh, neurotransmitter function in the genes uh, in your gene list than would be expected by random chance. And then you, you choose a predefined cutoff. Very often, this predefined cutoff is 5% uh, uh, p-value. Uh, and then 
if you see that uh, there are more than expected number of neurotransmitter genes, then you propose a hypothesis that maybe drug sensitivity in brain cancer has something to do with the reduced neurotransmitter signaling. You perform this analysis over all your, all your pathways and then apply multiple testing correction and anything that's, uh, that has a significant p-value after this multiple testing correction will be deemed significant and will be added to your potential bottom hypothesis. Uh, there are many tools that uh, perform this type of basic analysis of, uh, of, uh, of gene lists. Uh, one of them is G-Profiler that I developed during my PhD. Uh, this is a typical output of G-Profiler uh, where you have enriched pathways from top to bottom and then your input gene list is shown from left to right and then there's a, a, a certain amount of information that's being displayed. Uh, these are the pathways uh, that, that were found. Uh, there are some numbers involved, how large is the pathway, how large is the gene set, and how many genes are in common. Uh, there's a p-value to it, and then there's a matrix of annotations showing uh, which genes are associated to which pathway. I'll be talking about that tool a little more during the next lectures. So this is an excellent way of summarizing uh, public literature and public databases and public knowledge in order to characterize gene function. So instead of going through all these papers, you have a a kind of gene set approach to storing pathway information. However, this can quickly grow overwhelming. So you have this uh, well-performed experiment that gives you all these neat pathways, uh, and then you get this massive list of uh, uh, highly significant pathways that characterize your, your experimental gene list. And this is for multiple reasons. Uh, there's a lot of redundancy in gene function biologically, so genes do multiple things. And on the other hand, there's a lot of redundancy in how people store biological data in databases. Uh, so part of that is because uh, functions, biological functions are different, but it's still quite similar, and then genes are annotated to those functions in a redundant way. And so instead of staring at these tables endlessly in, uh, in, say, Excel spreadsheets, we can use visualization techniques that allow you to compress all these uh, highly similar but somewhat different pathways into uh, network-related maps. So this, is, this technique is called the enrichment map, and this is a network of pathways, so to say. So each node here in this network represents a gene set uh, that's a, a pathway or a process, and these pathways or processes are linked to one another if they share large numbers of genes, so if they're similar in, in, in a particular way. And when we apply network visualization techniques, then we can group together those uh, groups of the pathways or, or processes that share many genes. And then instead of looking at the, uh, at the list uh, or a, a spreadsheet of all these pathways, we can look at the network and visually or manually identify major functional themes that are present in your gene list. Uh, so th this is a great technique uh, to do after you've done your pathway enrichment analysis and you want to know how to summarize the results. Uh, here's a bit of a longer motivating example how to characterize the genetics of autism spectrum disorder. This was a paper where our lab uh, collaborated in the analysis. So autism is a uh, autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. It's a highly inheritable disorder. Uh, in monozygotic twins, uh, the genetics, uh, they share a diagnosis in 60 to 90 percent of cases, depending on the stringency of the diagnosis. About 5 to 15 percent are known to be single gene disorders and chromosomal arrangements. Yes? Uh, this one? What is the edge? Yes. So the edge means that uh, that one pathway and the other pathway, uh, they share a lo large number of genes. Uh, so, yes. So that pulls together the pathways that uh, are somewhat similar because they involve similar genes. Uh, the, the edge differentiations, we will also go through that later. Uh, you can set uh, the way the edges are defined, and whether it's like 30% or 50% genes shared. And the higher the percentage, the more granular the map will become. So if you want to have a, a large map with many different, with a small but 
large modules, then you define your map uh, by a, a lenient edge definition. If you want a stringent edge definition, you will have uh, many different small functional themes that represent the biological uh, pathways in your data. More of that will come during the third, the last session of this um, tutorial. Right. Any other questions on the previous slide? So you should know that the group of the genes is not, yes. not a single gene. Exactly. So it's a network of uh, pathways or network of gene sets. So the larger nodes uh, represent larger networks. Pardon? Okay, I'll repeat all the questions. <laughs> right. So what was your question first? <laughs> Right. Uh, the question is whether uh, the way the networks are connected also represents redundancy. It does. Because uh, where you see that, uh, for example, the blue big cluster here is quite densely connected, and then there are these outliers forming almost another new cluster which is not exactly related to the bigger one. That means that, uh, that the genes shared within here, it's probably one big gene set that's shared among all these different pathways, and then it branches out to a diff smaller different pathway where the gene sets are less shared. Does that answer? Uh, it's a bit of magic because the moment you change the threshold of the edge definition, it, it will visually change a lot in the, in the map. And uh, it's quite likely, for example, that this cluster here will become its own cluster because this, the weak edges will be removed as you change the threshold. Right, so uh, how, to how to keep the threshold? In most cases, you try the default th threshold first, and then you see whether you are able to interpret the map right away. By interpreting, I mean you eyeball the cluster and see if you can assign a single functional theme to it. For example, can you say, this is the apoptosis cluster? If you cannot say that, then you probably need to fine tune the way the, the weights are defined, the edge weights are defined. For example, maybe it's partly an apoptosis cluster and partly a differentiation cluster, then that, that doesn't, you can't put a single label to it. Then you try to split them a little bit apart. Or in other cases, maybe there are so many different apoptosis clusters all over the place, and then you set the, uh, the reset the threshold for the edges, and then they all will merge because they are all based on the, on the same gene set. So is there a way to set uh, different types of edges? Absolutely, but, uh, but you need to tweak that a little bit more. And uh, it's, it's all going through the Cytoscape software, so you can add more edges to it and uh, relabel the edges and do a lot of things, but it's, uh, it's like artistry. Any other questions? I guess. Uh, so why don't we, uh, yes. So about the example of how to generate a really fancy enrichment map, uh, I guess uh, the motivation of, to study autism is that not, lot, not a lot is known about the genetics. There's about 5 to 15% uh, of uh, cases that come from known gene 
alterations or copy number uh, alterations. And then uh, there's also so-called de novo copy number variation emergent that, that's not apparent in the parents, but that, that has emerged uh, in children. And in this particular study, about 2,000 individuals were, um, were profiled in the, for copy number variations, about 900 cases and 1,100 controls of European origin, uh, using a, a SNP chip uh, from Illumina. And they produced some highly uh, high quality rare copy number variations with a high, var vari high validation rate. And it turned out that uh, uh, on average, a person had two copy number variations uh, with a median size of about 200 kV. And many, uh, well, a good fraction of ASD individuals had at least one de novo copy number variation. And the top 10 genes already were quite convincing because they were known to be related to copy number, uh, to autism spectrum disorders. Uh, and here's a pretty nice looking enrichment map with a lot of detailed information you can see. Uh, and it greatly highlights all the different uh, aspects uh, of, um, of neurosystem development, for example, that uh, are potentially altered by all these copy number variations. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a great leap from the standard enrichment map that you can produce because there's all, all these different additional visual aspects that refl reflect uh, uh, aspects of data. Yes, but it's not the default output of the plugin. So, so many, many other things have been added, for example, nodes of different shapes and sizes. And we can zoom in into the cluster and then this gives you an idea what the enrichment map uh, is supposed to do. On the one hand, uh, you, you call it a major functional theme such as the central neurosystem development, which represents this cluster, but you can highlight individual members of this cluster in order to say, well, these are the specific pathways and networks that are part of this greater functional theme. So again, instead of looking at the table of uh, pathway output, you visualize that, that as a network, and then you can choose which information to highlight and how to summarize it and represent it as a, as a figure. So for those papers, I always do know how to, like, what message I get, because most of the uh, you're developed pathways, you expect them to be there. Mm -hmm. So, like, do we look at the size of the nodes, or do we, do we you look at the density of the edges? So, all of that information is important. So, so the, size, the question was whether what, what you should look at when you look at an enrichment map. Uh, the default enrichment map, uh, the size of the node says how many genes in your experiment are related uh, to that pathway. And then the, the weight of the edge tells you how many genes are shared between two pathways that are connected. So that information already tells you something. Uh, on top of that, they, for example, you may be able to say which genes specifically are part of that pathway that's been there as a node. But for that, you need to do a little bit of manual lookup in the cytoscape. Did they also provide a score? Right. Uh, I think that the, by default, the, the yeah. <laughs> okay. So, is whether there is a score that allows you to rank or look at the pathway enrichment map to rank which ones are on the top? The, I think the brighter colors by default tell you the more enriched or the highest higher enriched uh, pathways in the map. Any other questions? Okay, I'm moving on. Uh, so where do gene lists come from? And I'm sure that you guys have a, even a better idea than I do because you are, everyone is working on their own experiments and they generate their gene list. Uh, it may seem that it's uh, very different and difficult to uh, analyze gene lists for different platforms and data sets and uh, techniques, uh, but there are all these statistical uh, ways of uh, say ranking and clustering and network analysis that all produce lists of genes. So for the, for the simplest type of pathway enrichment analysis, you just work with a list of genes. No strings attached, a plain list of genes. Uh, however, many biological uh, experiments give you naturally ordered lists. For example, when you analyze uh, gene expression data, 
some genes have a higher fold change relative to the control, they can be ranked first. Uh, you can also quantify these gene lists and that for each gene attach a number to it and there are advanced pathway analysis techniques that take these numbers into account and then perform uh, quali qualitative an uh, analysis or quantitative, sorry. And whatever type of data set you have, you may be able to use some of the more well-known uh, statistical techniques that are broadly applicable, for example, ranking, filtering, clustering, principal component analysis, that all can produce some types of meaningful lists from your data. You can also look at already pre-existing uh, data sets such as networks, protein-protein interaction networks, microRNA, target gene interactions, transcription factor binding sites. All these data sets provide meaningful ways to analyze, uh, to create lists and analyze them in a pathway context. Uh, you can study a genetic screen, uh, such as a, a knockout library of uh, all yeast uh, uh, mutants of genes. And then uh, plenty of information can be extracted from genome-wide association studies. So what do gene lists mean? This is probably one of the major topics of this lecture. Gene lists could mean a biological system that's been altered or affected by your experiment or maybe a biological process that's affected in a group of diseased individuals versus controls. Uh, a gene list could mean genes with similar functions, such as transcription factors or kinases that all become activated or deactivated due to some condition. Uh, gene lists could uh, mean genes uh, apparent in a particular uh, cellular location, such as all nuclear proteins. Or they could mean uh, all the genes that are co-located in a particular chromosomal region maybe due to a copy number variation. And then all the biological questions that you want to answer uh, when analyzing uh, uh, things with pathways. First of all, you want to understand what you want to achieve with, the, with your biological experiment. And this is hopefully even before you go and do the experiment. Uh, you want to, perhaps you want to summarize the biological processes that are apparent in your data or maybe you want to perform differential analysis. What pathways are there in diseased uh, individuals that are not there in healthy controls? Maybe you want to find the controller for a process, and that's also part of a pathway analysis. Maybe a microRNA, maybe a transcription factor. Uh, you can use uh, the birds of a feather principle to assign functions to genes uh, and perform validation experiments, or you may want to uh, prioritize genes for those. Uh, in the first lecture, I will cover pathway enrichment analysis, just uh, comparison of gene sets. But uh, further, we can also do network analysis to predict gene function, or maybe find new interactors for a specific list of genes, or regulatory network analysis, where we find uh, transcription factor binding sites, uh, for example. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are two major inputs to pathway enrichment analysis. One of them is a list of genes, and one of them is a a group of gene sets uh, corresponding to pathways. Uh, the first topic will be uh, dealing with gene identifiers. There are so many different gene identifiers uh, and it's often kind of overwhelming to deal with them. An ideal identifier is a unique stable identifier that links to a particular gene or a protein of interest. By unique I mean that it hasn't been used for a different identifier at a different time. And gene and protein information is stored in many databases. And many databases focus on their particular aspects. For example, Uniprot is clearly a protein database, and they don't really provide information about genes. Uh, and uh, therefore, as there are many databases, each one of them has their own type of ID, and it becomes difficult to convert between those two, between them in general. And it's important to understand about what different databases are about, for example, Andre gene doesn't really store the sequence of that gene, it just points, provides a pointer to a sequence database. And as these pointers change, you can also see how things change and the uh, protein uh, or gene IDs are not stable over time. So here's a, a few common identifiers that are used. It's a long list, but believe me, the list is even much longer. There are certain uh, uh, IDs that belong to genes, others that are focusing on RNAs, others yet that are focusing on proteins. And then there are all these species-specific databases that have their own IDs. For example, either the human uh, uh, 
genome database or mouse or rat or so on. And then the, there are yet other types of IDs that relate to experimental platform, for example, uh, Affymetrix or Illumina or so on. Uh, the problem is that most software tools only support their limited lists of IGs and others are not supported. And then you need to map your gene list or, or ID list to a standard ID list. And the main use is being uh, finding your favorite genes uh, and locating other resources that are available for analyzing genes. You need to translate things, even in the biological sense, sometimes you need to translate things from probe set IDs or microarrays to protein IDs in order to perform interaction network analysis. And you need to merge data from different sources, you need a common reference. So the problem with many IDs is that they are one to many. So one ID could mean many actual proteins. Uh, there are uh, ambiguities often coming from historical reasons. For example, TP53, a known uh, cancer gene, has all these different symbols in different organisms and different platforms. So you need to, most cases you need to use one standard symbol that's uh, widely acknowledged. Then if you're using Excel, then this is a notorious case where the stem cell regulator OCT4 is converted to October 4, which you don't really want. So you need to paste and copy and paste this list carefully. And there are always problems reaching 100% coverage because things change over time. Uh, here is a cautionary example where a particular nature paper was retracted because they thought they were analyzing one gene, but it turned out to be another gene that was regulated by a microRNA uh, in their experiment. So be really careful about those types of situations. Uh, here's an ID mapping service provided by the uh, G-Profiler tool. It's pretty straightforward. It's based on the Ensemble, Ensemble Biomart database that gives us all these indexes between converting IDs. And all you need to do is invert, uh, insert the gene list. Uh, it can be a mixed set of different IDs. And select the type of output that you wish. There's a long list of them. This is for human. And you'll get back a table. Uh, and when you go to Ensemble Biomart, you can actually download all these comprehensive lists of, uh, uh, of translation tables. It's really useful. So as I said, So the question is about losing genes while converting between uh, rat and human. So one, one question is, uh, if you were using that particular tool set, then I wonder whether you... Okay. So if you're doing all ortholog conversions, then I assume it's expected that some genes are lost. But uh, I would say I need to understand more about the problem. So maybe we can talk about it offline. What do you mean by uh, reaching 100% coverage when you convert the ID? Yeah, so for example, you can have a gene list coming from your microarrays, and uh, some of the map identifiers won't be mappable by any tool at all because some they will either be missed or there will be some aliases that are ambiguous, and then in order to uh, get rid of those missing aliases, you may, may need to do some manual work. For example, go check that alias in multiple different gene databases and make sure that you understand to which gene it's actually pointing to. So the example with uh, the Nature paper, things like that happen, where exactly the same symbol has been used for completely different genes and different chromosomes with different functions and so on. So this, this work will probably never be precisely done by any computational tool. Okay, so on top of that ambiguous mappings, there's now in, in G-Profile, there's a dialogue that allows you to manually check if there's an ambiguity, which team to choose to proceed with. Uh, so a couple of recommendations how to deal with these uh, IDs, one of them being uh, focus on a particular well-identified or well-acknowledged set of IDs, such as uh, Andre gene IDs of official gene symbols. 
Uh, and uh, when, you, when you really want 100% coverage, use a spreadsheet. Make sure that the copy-paste works well so you don't get October 4. Uh, then you need to perhaps uh, look at the multiple databases such as gene cards, ensembles, species databases in order to make sure that your missing symbols are mapped correctly. Uh, and uh, you know, I mentioned the Excel thing already. So to summarize this part quickly, uh, many IDs uh, have been invented for different genes and proteins and molecules and so on. Uh, and when you do any kind of genomics analysis, you may need to convert from one to another repeatedly. And this is a, a task that all bioinformaticians sort of despise. Uh, but it's, uh, it's required to do, and not always the software tools will do all the work for you. And they use common IDs such as uh, symbols in order to do your mapping. So meanwhile, I heard that there was a question about defining a pathway. In the context of this lecture, I would like to define a pathway as a list of genes that has been previously annotated to a particular function. So in this case, pathway doesn't involve the interactions between the genes, but we're talking about a set of genes such as these are all neurotransmitter genes. Let's call that the neurotransmitter pathway. In further lectures, people will talk about uh, how to consider pathways when there are interactions between. So one pathway member regulates another pathway member. Uh, in this particular gene set, enrichment analysis is a pathway, is a list of genes that's associated to a common function. So the main purpose of analyzing pathways is that we don't need to go back to the literature to understand primary research that was performed to understand uh, gene function, but instead we can go to a pathway where all that information has been stored gene by gene, function by function, and then analyze that using computational techniques to better highlight the biology in our experiment. Uh, pathways are mostly collected into several resources. The more, uh, the more famous one is called the gene ontology, which we will focus on mostly during this uh, presentation. Gene ontology uh, has biological processes, cell components, molecular functions stored in it. There are many other pathway databases, about 500, that store information about pathways. Uh, for example, Reactome and KEG are commonly used pathways for multiple species. And then there are all these other annotations, such as uh, so chromosomal positions, or protein domains, or disease associations, and so on and so on. All of that can be used systematically in order to perform gene set enrichment analysis. In most common cases, people look at the gene ontology and perhaps a few pathway databases. So the gene ontology uh, is like a dictionary. It's like a book when you open up and you see definitions of different terms. Uh, it's a dictionary for biological phrases, uh, for such as a protein kinases, uh, which, uh, which is a type of a protein, or apoptosis, which is a type of a process, or membrane, which is a type of a cell component. Uh, so it, uh, gene ontology is a dictionary of terms, but it also has term de definitions. Uh, it's a formal system for describing knowledge, and it's also like a hierarchy. So there's a system how those different terms are arranged between one another. So this is a, an example of the hierarchy. For example, we can talk about B-cell apoptosis, which is a part of an apoptosis. It's a, it's a type of an apoptosis, which is a type of cell death, uh, which is a biological process. And so all these terms or uh, uh, ideas are arranged in the, in the ontology in a hierarchical manner, using relationships such as part of or is a. And it describes multiple levels of detail of, uh, of processes and pathways. So this is where the redundancy comes in. Uh, all these terms can have multiple uh, parents or multiple children, so it's a, it's a structured way of representing knowledge. So there are, uh, gene ontology covers three major trees, or three major structures, one of them representing cell components, the other molecular functions, and then biological processes. The last one is usually most convenient for analyzing uh, your experimental lists for biological uh, pathways and processes. So where do Go terms come from? Uh, they are added by editors at the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, uh, in collaboration with multiple groups uh, who are annotating genome data. Terms are added by requests, and experts help with those major developments. And here's a quick graph showing that uh, Go is a live and evolving uh, structure of knowledge. Uh, 
for example, it, uh, between uh, now and a few years back, back it has grown 16%. So 16% more new terms were added to the structure. Uh, another part of Go is the part of annotations, uh, where genes are linked or associated with Go terms as the scientific knowledge uh, uh, improves. And these are known as gene annotations or gene associations. And importantly, every gene ha can have multiple annotations. Uh, and some, out some of those are created by manual curation by experts, and others are created automatically. So you can already, already see that there's a difference in quality how these annotations are created. Uh, here's an example how uh, genes and proteins get annotated to the tree. And this is important to understand when you look at pathway enrichment analysis because you see a lot of overlapping processes and, uh, and things coming out. For example, there's a kinase called Aurora kinase B that is known to be part of B cell apoptosis. And then in the process, it is actually automatically added to all the parent terms of that process. So it's not only associated with B cell apoptosis, it's associated to apoptosis in general, as well as cell death, as well as death, as well as biological process. So it's sort of growing up in the tree, the annotations. Uh, annotation sources, yeah. Yes. So the question is whether this hierarchical annotation up to the uh, top of the tree is also used in pathway enrichment analysis. And yes, that's correct. So this is where the redundancy comes from. This is why you always see not one cell cy cycle process uh, uh, enriched in your gene set, but dozens. Because all these terms uh, in the bottom of the hierarchy are basically the same thing with subtle differences and they get annotated up the tree so they become more and more general, but also more and more redundant. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. You can. Uh, yes, you can find out which Go term is associated primarily. Uh, in most cases, you need to go to the original table to look it up. Is there a minimal number of genes? I have one gene, yes. and it represents some kind of the process. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how large can a Go category be? And it can be of a single, for a single, single gene, if you manage to convince the Go editor that it's really novel and it has to be there and so on. And then in the future, more genes will be added. In the pathway enrichment step, you can actually set filters of how large gene sets you want to look at. And that helps you to better, better fine tune the results. So annotation sources are diverse. They're basically based on what types of experiments were used in order to link that gene to that function. Uh, and they are manual annotations are curated by scientists. But the manual annotations are unfortunately a minority because it takes a lot of time to curate bioprimary literature. Uh, and then instead, the, the Go team also uses uh, reviewed computation analysis where they run algorithms and they validate that the algorithms are fine. But there's also a fraction of Go annotations that are made purely electronically by, the, by downloading data from other databases or by annotating gene functions from different species. And then that, that is the part of Go that is less, uh, less annotated, less taken care of, and also probably a little, a little bit more noisy. So when conducting pathway enrichment analysis or any other pathway analysis, you should be aware of the type of uh, annotations that were used in order to link genes and pathways. And just that helps you to also validate and prioritize your findings. The indicator whether these are in manual review or yes. Okay. So there is an indicator uh, in some tools, including GProfile, that we cover which what type of evidence was given uh, in the annotation process. So uh, Go itself maintains all these evidence types that you can see here. Here are some experimental evidence types. 
uh, such as mutant phenotype. Uh, here are some computational evidence types, such as uh, sequence similarity. Uh, then there are author statements, such as author X said that gene X is related to process Y, and so on. And then there's the electronic annotation format. Uh, in G-Profiler, we use uh, colors in order to indicate which type of evidence was used. And then the more red tones represent more stronger experimental evidence, and then the bluer tones represent electronic evidence. So you can also just quickly look uh, what is the type of evidence that was used in order to infer the pathways uh, for the gene set or gene list. Uh, Go covers a lot of species, uh, and these species uh, information about the species initi is initiated by species-specific databases. There, there's a lot of information about human, a lot of information about model organisms. Uh, there are some bacterial and parasite species through tiger and so on. And then the ensemble database takes good care of annotating further species for which they have genome sequences available to have even more data from Go. Pardon? So, so the TP53 in rat is a TRP53, I believe. Uh, right, so, yeah. so, so, yes. No. Uh, so the question is whether, you, when you do species-specific analysis, whether you have to convert manually between IDs or from human to, to other species. Uh, no, you don't. But, but you may have to take care that you're not giving it the wrong input yourself. So at least in G-Profiler, all the IDs are mapped. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. I would say that uh, the question is about IDs and capital letters. I would say many tools convert the input IDs to capital letters anyway, so, so you shouldn't worry about capital letters. Yes, you're right. So the question is whether what do you do when you have several names for the same gene? You should choose the standard one. For human, I'm sure there's a, there's a list of genes that are called standard. So the nomenclature, you should always refer to that. 
So maybe we can continue that discussion uh, in one of the next sessions because I really need to finish this deck before you go on a break in 15 minutes. So, yes, that will be a practical part where you can go and test these uh, Gene ID tools. So. To get to back to the point how uh, a lot of that information is experimental, but much, much more is still computational, here's a chart that shows you how different species, how many annotations are available, and what fraction of them are actually experimental, and what fraction of them are derived from by computational means. So you can see that most species, well, all of them actually have a majority of information coming from computational predictions, which is fine, because there are certain types of experiments that you can never do for human, but you can infer them from mouse, for example. Uh, there are many contributing databases. There are species-specific databases, and then there are these large-scale databases such as Ensemble that try to incorporate information from many species. And there's a, there's a type of uh, gene ontology called the ghost limb that, that attempts to minimize and trim the entire Go tree for, for some certain uses where there is clearly too much information. For example, if you have this complex tree of different terms, it's very difficult to draw a pie chart of uh, of things represented in your gene set, but it's more feasible to do when you look at the ghost limb set, where the vast majority of detail has been pruned in order to provide a simplified version of annotations. There are many software tools allowing you to analyze Go. Go itself and all the associated tools are publicly available for people to use without restrictions, and then many other groups have created gene ontology analysis tools for various tasks. So to access Go, there are many tools. Some of them are developed by the Go consortium. Here's one, it's called Quick Go. You can go look up your terms of interest in the, in the structure. You can visualize this tree. You can look at different associations that are part of the tree, and you can look up individual proteins and their functions in the tree. Uh, Go is not the only ontology that, systemi that uses systematic uh, representation of biological knowledge. Here's a, a cell type ontology uh, that represents different types of cells and their, and, and their organization. And besides Go, you have all these uh, pathway databases. There are more than 500 of them. So going through them one by one is not, is not very uh, optimal. And there's a database called Pathway Commons, which is a meta database of da database, databases, and it merges uh, the major pathway databases in a smart way. Uh, and then besides pathways, you can use any type of gene annotations uh, in order to perform pathway enrichment analysis. For example, you can use protein domains or transcription factor binding sites or chromosomal positions, depending on really your application, what you're interested in. Some, some ways of deriving these attributes, Ensemble Biomart is a really convenient uh, way of extracting information from Ensemble. You can get a similar type of features from Entree gene. And if you're looking at the particular model organism, you might, may find that model organism database your best source of knowledge. Uh, here's a quick overview of how to browse the, the Ensemble Biomark. It has a pretty uh, uh, neat uh, user interface. It's updated every three months or so. Uh, here you can just first select the genome that you're interested in and uh, the, the set of uh, annotations for that genome. Uh, you can set, select from a large variety of filters in order to determine which genes you're interested in, and then select uh, attributes you wish to download. That they could be uh, all types of attributes, including you know, protein level features, or regulatory features, or sequences, or whatever. Uh, to summarize uh, the points of the, of the second part of pathway analysis inputs, uh, pathways and other gene attributes are available in different databases. Gene ontology is one of the major ones that people use, uh, but uh, there are also many da databases uh, for pathways. Some of them are species-specific. Gene ontology has a wide coverage of different species. 
Uh, it is the geontology is a classification system and dictionary for biological concepts. So there are two parts. It's the dictionary, so the biological terms, and then the annotations to these terms, associations with different genes. Uh, keep in mind that uh, every gene can have multiple annotations, and it will have multiple annotations due to the hierarchical rule of more general and more specific terms. Uh, some genomes are more annotated than others, uh, and some annotations are better quality than others. And for particular reasons, you may look at the Go Slim data set that provides a simplified uh, structure of Go. Here's a, a small overview of the pathway enrichment analysis uh, diagram, which starts with a, a raw data, goes to a gene list, uh, looks at uh, pathways in a statistical way, and then looks at pathways in a visual way. You can choose some of those pathways to drill down to mechanism, bring them back to the genes, and then perhaps perform validation experiments and publish an experimental paper. Uh, however, um, no diagram like that is always as simple as it seems. There's way more to it. Uh, you can analyze pathways uh, just by gene set analysis, but you can also look at the interactions within pathways. You can look at, uh, instead of small scale pathways or gene sets of a common function, you can look at large scale interaction networks such as protein-protein interaction networks covering all proteins. Uh, and there's more to it, so there will be a lot of this will be repeated over the coming lectures and a lot of new information will be added as well. So maybe we can continue all the discussions that we had and I'm a bit early.